The words to which I should like to call your attention this evening are to be found in the, in the book of the prophet Ezekiel, in the 36th chapter, in verses 31 and 32. Verses 31 and 32, in the 36th chapter of the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways, and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God, be it known unto you. Be ashamed. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God, be it known unto you. Be ashamed and confounded for your ways. O house of Israel. We are still continuing, you see, our consideration of this great passage of Scripture which starts at the 16th verse in this 36th chapter of the book of the prophet Ezekiel. And we are doing so because it gives us such a perfect account and portrayal of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in its various steps and stages. Whatever other purposes and objects there were in the giving of this word to Ezekiel to give to Israel, and there undoubtedly were others, it spoke to them in their then condition, as prophecy always did and always does, it may contain also a prophecy of something that is yet to happen to Israel. But I say that clearly it is a very striking and a very notable statement of the gospel of redemption in and through our blessed Lord and Savior. And that is why I'm calling your attention to it. Now it is important that we should know what the gospel is in its various parts and portions and steps and stages. Not only that we may come to enjoy its marvelous and its incomparable blessings, but also because we may be taught how to distinguish and to differentiate between that which is true and that which is false. Now, mankind, as the result of sin, is in a state of misery. We are all unhappy. There is no such thing as the poets even have often reminded us as perfect happiness in a world like this. Dryden tells us, since every man who lives is born to die, and none can know sincere felicity. There isn't such a thing. In this world, there's always a fly in the ointment. There's always something wrong, always something that detracts and tends to spoil everything. The world and its peoples are in trouble. We are in difficulties, and we are seeking for solutions, looking for happiness and peace and joy. Nobody wants to be miserable. Nobody likes to be unhappy. Very well, there is our position. Now, God, uh, the Bible tells us, and it's the great message of the Bible, has done something about that. But alas, unfortunately, there is somebody else also who is trying to do something about that. God has provided his gospel, which is a way of deliverance and of redemption and of emancipation. He has even sent his only son from heaven to earth in order to do that. He has even sent him to the death of the cross in order to do that. Ah, yes, but the devil 
the great antagonist of God, in his hatred of God, and in his desire to spoil God's universe and to wreck the perfection which it once had. He comes along and in various ways he offers his message, his proposals, his ideas with regard to the solution of our various problems. And therefore nothing is quite so important for us as to learn uh, how to differentiate between the true and the false. That which is God's way and these other spurious ways, these other gospels which as Paul says are no gospels, but which come in such a pleasing and attractive manner and offer so much to us as to entice us and to bewitch us and to mislead the ignorant and the, the uninitiated. Nothing, therefore, I say, is quite so important as just that. And that is where I say it is so important for us to discuss and to consider together a passage of Scripture such as this, which takes us into the details and shows us the steps and the stages. Now, let's be quite clear about this. There are many agencies in the world tonight that are offering people happiness, offering them peace, offering them rest. I needn't trouble you by mentioning them. You're aware of them. You can read about them. They're publicized. They have their literature on the bookstalls. They have their books and their devotees. They have their meetings. Some of them even claim to have their churches. And they tell you that if you believe their message, you'll no longer worry. You'll never again be unhappy. You'll sleep perfectly. Your illnesses, physical illnesses, may be healed and taken from you. And a thousand and one other things. They seem to be offering to do the very things that the Bible tells us that God's way of salvation also is designed to do and offers to do. Very well, then, I say, the Bible knows all that. And that is why it is so careful to tell us and to teach us as to how we can differentiate between the true and the false. And the Bible's reason for doing that is this. Our eternal destiny depends upon this matter. If this were the only life and the only world, perhaps it wouldn't matter very much as to what it is that gives me peace and happiness and joy. If I knew for certain that when I came to die, well, that that's the end of me and the end of my life, well, then, of course, the one thing that would matter would be just to know how to have a good time and how to be happy while I'm in this life and in this world. But, oh, the Bible tells us that it isn't only this life and this world. There is an eternity beyond it tells us that our souls go on forever and ever. Now then, in the light of that, says the Bible, you must be very careful that you really have that which is true and not the false. The problem is not merely how can I be right here, how can I be right there throughout all eternity. The issues, you see, are tremendous. It isn't only this life. This life, according to the Bible, is merely a kind of antechamber to the great and eternal life that lies before us all. And therefore he tells us that we really must pay deep attention to this at all costs. We must be certain that what is helping us is indeed God's method. Because according to the Bible again, this is the only right method. This is the only true one, and everything else is indeed of the devil. Well, now then, the whole question that arises is, how are we to discover this, the difference between the true and the false? The Bible, I say, answers the question, and it answers it like this. God's way of salvation is a whole consisting of many parts, 
And it tells us that the way we can be quite sure that we are believing the gospel and not something that looks like the gospel is that these various parts are always present and that never at any time are any of them absent. Now you see the importance of that proposition. The gospel is a whole, but yes, every part is essential to the whole. Therefore, if whatever has offered itself to you and which you have believed and which you think is all right and puts you right, if any one of these parts is not there, you should be highly suspicious. If any one of these parts is absent, you have to ask yourself again, is this God's way of salvation? the whole consisting of the parts. And, as I have indeed been emphasizing on these Sunday, evening, these Sunday evenings, not only does the gospel consist of a number of parts, and not only must they all always be present, but the order in which they come is of vital importance also. Very well. Now then, there is the principle which is so perfectly illustrated in this particular paragraph and in particular in the verses that we are going to look at this evening. God forbid that anybody should think I've been wasting time in saying all that. Your soul's salvation may depend upon grasping what I've just been saying. That's not mere introduction for the sake of introduction. There are people following cults in this and other countries tonight who say all is well, it solves their problems. But if this word is true, they're as damned and as hopeless tonight as they were before they went into the cult. That's why it's important for us to know how to differentiate. There are parts to this, and they're all essential, and the order in which they come is of vital significance. Very well, let me show you what I mean by putting it like this. Now, last Sunday night, those of us who were here were considering this statement. I will also save you from all your uncleannesses, and I will call for the corn and will increase it, and lay no famine upon you, and I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. And I said the great characteristic result of this gospel is peace and plenty, a full and an abounding salvation, a life which is life more abundant, a life which is life indeed, the glorious fullness, the joy and the happiness and the peace. But here I go on and I read, Then... When you've realized all that and had all that, then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Are you surprised? Are you amazed at the sequence? Do you feel like saying, oh, I'm not interested in that after all. You've been carrying me with you. This wonderful gospel of yours, you shall be my people and I shall be your God. And the corn and the wine and the happiness and the peace and the joy and the marvelous good time. But now you're talking about loathing ourselves. We don't like it. We don't want it. What a gospel. Fancy bringing us down after you've raised us up. Is that your reaction? Are you surprised at this? Are you amazed at it? My dear friend, this is of the very essence of the gospel. This is a most important text. This is a very vital statement in the whole matter of our salvation. Let me show you how. The cults and the false gospels never say this. Never. And that is why, you see, it's so important to know all these parts and portions. Indeed, the, the cults and the false gospels not only do not say this, they even hate this. And they denounce the Bible and the scriptures and the gospel for saying it. 
You take the psychological teaching, for instance, that's so popular today, and which seems so full of love and so full of joy and peace and which offers us such a marvelous deliverance. You put a verse like this to a psychologist and he'll denounce it. He'll say that old gospel made people miserable. It created problems. Man is not sinful. No, no, what men need is to trust themselves, to have self-confidence. You mustn't keep them down. Encourage them to express themselves, to believe in themselves. They've got it in them. And all these things that have been called sins, they say they're not sins. They're natural. They've been put into us by God and they're meant to be used and to be expressed. So don't repress and keep people down. They hate this. Not only do they not preach it and teach it, I say they literally hate it. All the cults and the false panaceas are in some way or another telling us to believe in ourselves and to trust to ourselves and to get out of ourselves and away from ourselves. And in this way they offer us everything that our hearts seem to be desiring. In other words, the cults and the false teachings are only interested in giving us relief. They're only interested in giving us certain benefits. They're not really interested in us in a profound manner. They're not interested in truth. They just want to get rid of the pain and the agony and the trouble. They all want us to be very happy and enjoying ourselves. They're not in terms of truth. But the Bible, you see, always brings this in. It's here in the Bible everywhere from the very beginning to the very end. The Bible starts with repentance. It goes on repeating it. The Bible inculcates this self-loathing. That's the term that is used here. You will, you shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Now, what does this word loathe mean in order that we may understand it? It means hatred of that which is hateful. It means hatred of that which is displeasing. It means a hatred of that which is offensive. It means to regard with disgust. It means an intense aversion. And what we are told here is that one of the effects of the gospel is to make a man look at himself like that. To loathe himself. To regard himself as an abomination and to regard himself with an intense sense of aversion and hatefulness and disgust. Now that, I say, is always a part of true Christianity. And unless we know something about this, I repeat, it behoves us to examine the very foundations of our position. You notice that this is said after we've been told about the new heart that God will give us. He's going to take out the stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. He's going to renew our hearts. He's going to put his spirit within us. After all that, then this comes. In other words, I am suggesting this that there is no more certain absolute proof of the fact that we have been born again and that we've got a new heart than that we know what it is to loathe ourselves. There is no teaching in the world tonight that says a thing like that but the gospel, not one. Well, now then, the question is, why should we loathe ourselves? What is it that makes us loathe ourselves? And the answer is perfectly plain and simple everywhere in the Bible. It's just this. This way of salvation and solving our problems is one that is based upon and that leads us to a knowledge of God. None of the others do that. The others start with us and they end with us. This is designed from beginning to end to bring us face to face with God. 
And whenever a man sees God, he sees himself and he loathes himself. That's why it happens. It's because it brings us, I say, to see God. Now, this is something that I could illustrate to you endlessly out of the scriptures. Let me give you just some examples. Take the famous example of Job who spends a lot of his time in arguing with God and grumbling and complaining and feeling that God isn't fair and so on. At last he comes to this position. God has spoken to him and has revealed himself. God has brought his pressure to bear upon him. Listen to him saying, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Why does he abhor himself? Because he's now face to face with God. While he was arguing with his friends, he didn't abhor himself. While he's arguing with God and about God, he didn't abhor himself. But now I see thee. And I abhor myself. He puts his hand upon his mouth. Didn't you notice it in that 51st Psalm? How David loathed himself. Why? Well, not simply because of what he'd done, but for this reason, against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. God! Do you remember the men in the 73rd Psalm? Oh, it'll, you'll come to it if you go on reading the Westminster Record. That men who complain so much of God's dealings with him, why are the ungodly so successful? Why is he having a hard time? It isn't fair. He's on the point of giving up and quitting and turning his back on God and all his people. He's washed his hands in vain and so on. Until he went into the sanctuary of God then and a study their end and then he saw God and this is what he said. I was as a beast before me. As a beast. Not only as a fool, I was a beast when I thought like that. He abhors himself, he loathes himself. Do you remember what happened to Isaiah when he had that vision of God? Oh, he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among a people of unclean lips. There is no health, there is no soundness, I'm vile. God! The moment a man comes near God, he sees himself and he loves himself. Do you remember what happened to the Apostle Peter? It took a good deal to bring a man like Peter down. Self-confident, impulsive, boastful. Yes, but you remember when our Lord performed that miracle and enabled them to catch fish? Suddenly there was this revelation of his glory and his Godhead. And even Peter turns to Christ and he says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. The presence of Christ, the manifestation of his glory, revealed his vileness to Peter. Oh, hasn't our Lord put it once and forever in the parable of the prodigal son, when the man comes to himself he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thy face, and am no more worthy to be thy son. He was too good to be his son when he left home at the beginning, but now he is unworthy to be his son. The Apostle Paul, in the seventh chapter of the epistle to the Romans, cries out in agony, saying, O wretched men that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This law of sin within my members, this thing that drags me down, this vileness that is within me, who shall deliver me? And then later on in writing to Timothy, looking back across his former life, he says, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. Oh, how ashamed he was. How he hated it all. He loathed himself. They all with one consent are saying what our hymn put so perfectly just now. Remember not past years. 
They want to forget them because they loathe themselves. Well, very well then, there you see is the scriptural teaching, so the question we address ourselves to briefly is this. What is it then that makes us loathe ourselves in that way? We see that all these men of God do, and I take it, I trust, we begin to see that if we don't know anything about this, we are unlike the greatest saints the world has ever known. They say with Charles Wesley, vile and full of sin I am. Do you know anything about that, my friend? Well, lest there be anybody in this congregation who's never loathed himself or never loathed herself, let me give you some of the reasons why you ought to be doing so. We should, first of all, loathe ourselves because of our folly. God here says through the prophet Ezekiel that they will do so. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves. It's going to happen for certain. And it did happen to them. They loathed themselves when they found themselves in Babylon and realized the truth. When they saw what they'd been and what they'd done, what fools they were, they loathed themselves. If only we could get back and have another chance, they said. And it's still the same, it's still true. You read the autobiography of any saint who's ever lived and you'll all find that they dwell on this folly. You see, when a man becomes a Christian and when his eyes are open to the truth, uh, he realizes this. He realizes the unutterable, indescribable folly of putting his own thoughts and ideas before those of God. There's nothing more foolish than that. Yet that is what men and women are doing by the million tonight. They're not interested in the Bible. They laugh at it. They ridicule it. Out of date, old-fashioned. And so on. And what are they putting before it? Here is a book that tells us about life and how life should be lived and enjoyed. They've dismissed it. What have they put before it? Well, the kind of life depicted in the Sunday newspapers. That's life. That's the philosophy. And when a man becomes awakened and when he has a new heart and a new mind and a new understanding, he says, is it credible? Could I have ever been such a fool? Could I have rejected all this, the mind of God and the exposition of eternity and time? I've rejected all that and look what I put in its place. My thoughts and my ideas, which I couldn't even argue out, and other people could often demolish my arguments, yet I stuck to that and rejected this. Oh, the folly of it all. And then you remember these children of Israel had turned their backs upon God and had been worshipping idols. Read the history. They heard of other nations with their gods made of wood and of stone and so on, and they'd made them and bowed down to them. They'd left God and had worshipped idols. But at last they've been awakened, and they realize something of the truth of the sarcasm of some of these prophets who ridicule idol worship. They say, your God, he's got eyes, but he can't see. He's got ears, but he can't hear. He's got a nose, but he can't smell. He's got legs, but he can't walk. That's your God, and you've worshipped him, and have turned your backs upon the living God. Fools. It is the fool who hath said in his heart, There is no God. And again, when a man comes to himself and has this enlightenment which the gospel alone can give, he sees what a fool he's been in being so long 
in coming to believe this gospel and to surrender himself to it, he looks back across all his clever arguments and the brilliant points that he scored, and he sees that all the time he was just fooling himself, just blinding himself, trying to buttress up a shaky position which never had any validity at all, and he went on doing it for years. He wasn't honest. He wasn't open. He wasn't really listening to the message. He was simply trying to think of things to put it down. He was all along defending his own position. He talked about free will and a free mind and an open outlook, but the whole time he sees he was governed by prejudice, and he hates and despises himself. This is nothing but sure experience. Whenever a man truly becomes a Christian, he looks back and he says, Oh, how could I have been such a fool? Ah, yes, but the height of the folly is seen in this. That not only had he been talking like that and saying such foolish and childish, irrational things, but he realizes now that in doing so he has actually been defying God. He has been resisting God. Though he is but a creature passing through time, whose life is so frail, here today and gone tomorrow, though he hasn't a guarantee that he'll be alive in a week's time. He doesn't hesitate today to stand up and say, very well, I'll defy it all, I don't care what you say. I'm the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. I'm not bowing down to you or God or to anybody else. I know, I trust my own mind and my own opinion. He defies God. The God in whose hand his breath is and all his ways. The God who made the cosmos out of nothing and could end it in a second. The God who is eternal and everlasting. The judge of all the earth who is absolutely righteous and holy. This little pygmy creature of time who stands in his greatness and who can be blown to nothing in a second defies the everlasting and eternal God. What would you think of a man who deliberately ran to the place where an atomic bomb is to be dropped? That's nothing to what a man does when he defies God and puts his little mind against the Scriptures and against the testimony of history, against the evidence of creation, against the life of the Lord Jesus Christ and his teaching, the Father eternal. Then shall you loathe yourselves. You'll despise yourself for your folly, your intellectual folly, your ignorance, your arrogance, Above all, I say, the folly of speaking at all about such a God when the whole time you're in his hands. Oh, I come back again to Job. The moment Job had this revelation of him, he put his hand upon his mouth. You know, it's because men have never known God that they talk so much about him and argue so much about him. It's because they don't know him. Nothing is so enjoyable as a religious argument. How marvelous. I, want, I say this and I say that about God. Oh, the folly of it all. I look back across my own little life and I loathe myself for some of the things I've said in my own cleverness. But the second cause for loathing ourselves is that we realize not only our folly, but our depravity. Then shall ye remember your own, notice the words, evil ways, and your doings that were not good. 
and shall loathe yourselves in your own sights for your iniquities and for your abominations. Those are the terms. What do I mean? Well, let me put it like this. When a man has received this new heart, this new life, this new understanding, he then looks back and looks at what he did before, and what does he see? Well, he sees the things that he did, and the things that he enjoyed, the things that he put before God, the things that he wouldn't give up in order to please even God. The things he thought were wonderful, he looks back at them. And this is what he says, evil, not good, iniquitous, abominable, vile, wretched, filthy, unclean. The essential vileness of the things themselves. Oh, I needn't keep you. Our blessed Lord gave a list of them. I read it to you just now out of the seventh chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark. Out of the heart come adulteries, murders, fornications, maliciousness. Oh, that horrible list of foul and of ugly things. You've got, you've got the same list at the end of the first chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans. There it is, men working with men, that which was unseemly. The woman even putting aside the natural use. Women with women doing that which is not seemly. Oh, the foulness and the vileness and the filth of it all. You needn't take my word for it. Read your evening newspaper every day and there you'll see it. I'm told that it's in one of the Sunday papers. There it is in detail for you. People are reading it and they're gloating over it. They're enjoying it. They think it's marvelous. But when a man has a new heart and he looks back, he says, how could I? The vileness and the foulness and the filth of it all. Oh, my dear friends, you can't know God and see those things as you once saw them. You'll hate yourself forever having even looked at them. Well, that comes to my second point, which is this, that we loathe ourselves because of that evil nature that is within us that ever made us like them and want them. You see, it isn't only that we've done those things and liked them. The terrible thing is this that there's anything in us at all that ever wanted to do so and that enjoyed doing so. That's the horrible thing. That's why our Lord said, you see, it isn't that which goes in, it's that which comes out. It's the vileness that's within that expresses itself in that way. If we were pure, those things would be ugly and hateful. It's because we are vile. That's why they appeal. And there's no more terrible discovery in this world than just to discover that that's the sort of nature you've got, that you're perverted and twisted, that you're unclean, that evil, foul, iniquitous, abominable things please you. And even when you stop doing them, partly because you may be afraid, you still like reading about them. You like hearing about them. You surreptitiously borrow novels, perhaps from a library, in order to get stimulated by them. That's it. There's a craving. There's a desire. There's a fountain of evil within us all. We're all rotten, vile, and full of sin, I am. It's true of all of us. But it's only the men enlightened by the Spirit of God who comes to see it. The others enjoy it and defend it. Or then we can put it like this, you see. It's the depravity within us that makes us antagonists of God. It's this evil within us that makes us hate the law of God. It is this evil nature within us that makes us hate the biblical teaching about holiness. Ha, this, uh, that Christianity of yours, so narrow. 
So cramped, prohibiting everything that's marvelous, tying you down, hemming you in. Oh, the narrowness of Christianity. Isn't that the popular argument? Isn't that the thing to say, it's too narrow, abominably narrow? That's nothing but another way of saying that you hate holiness. For judged by that criterion, the narrowest person this world has ever seen is the Lord Jesus Christ. He never did any of those things. He didn't want to. They didn't appeal to him. He was sorry for people who did them. That's why he sat with them and spoke to them, not to join in, but to deliver them out of it. And when a man comes to realize this, he hates himself. He loathes himself. Why should I not desire holiness? Why should I feel that the gospel is hard? Why should I feel that God's commandments are grievous? Why should I not want to live like this and follow Christ and be like him? Why should I talk about sacrifices and about giving up as if the gospel gave me nothing? Why is it? It's because my very nature is rotten. And I loathe myself because of it and because of my vileness. The second reason, therefore, is our depravity. And that brings me to my third and last reason for loathing ourselves, which is our base ingratitude. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and for your abominations. Not for your sakes do I this, saith the Lord God, be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. What's he mean? He means this. The children of Israel had been brought into being by God. He'd put them in the land of Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. He'd done it all for them for nothing. They had done nothing except rebel and grumble and complain. It was all of the largesse and the munificence and the grace and the mercy of God. He'd given it all to them as a free gift. But they didn't appreciate it. They'd have preferred to be like the other nations. They preferred to go their own ways. They spat into the face of God. They spat upon his gifts. They despised the good land. And that is why they're in captivity. And now at last they see it, what fools they've been, how depraved they are. Yes, but the base ingratitude. They didn't appreciate what God had done for them. They threw back the gift into his face. And you know, when you realize you've done a thing like that, you feel that there is nothing, finally, that is so despicable as that. To defy the might and the power of God, as I've said, is unutterable folly. But to spurn his love is infinitely worse. There is nothing more terrible we ever do to any human individual in this life than to show a lack of appreciation for goodness and kindness. There is nothing so terrible as to spurn love. And yet, my friends, that is what all who are not Christians are doing with God. There is a sense in which I understand the men objecting to the teaching and the law and the holiness it's all wrong, you shouldn't object. But there is a sense in which one can understand that. But there is something that even defies understanding. It is the way in which men and women can spurn and reject the love of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life.
If God had only given the law through Moses and the Ten Commandments and the exalted teaching on holiness and no more, in a sense, I say, there might even be some sort of an excuse. But God hasn't stopped at that. When the fullness of the times was come, God sent forth his own son, made of a woman, made under the law, the babe in the manger at Bethlehem, is God's only son, his only begotten son. That babe in Bethlehem has come out of the eternal bosom. He has left the courts of heaven and of glory to come to that, to be born of a woman in a stable, placed in a manger. God's love to men in sin even. God has sent his only son into the world to redeem the world. God not only sent him into the world to teach us and to preach to us and to live before us, Still more amazing and incredible is this. God sent his only begotten son into the world to die. God so loved the world that he gave. That includes the cross, remember. He gave him even unto death. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. It was God who sent him to the cross. It was God who ordained his death. It was God who gave him the commission to come and bear the sins and the guilt of men and receive their punishment in order that men might be forgiven. It was God who planned it. It was God who sent him and the son came voluntarily. But God sent him. That's the love of God. And he didn't spare him anything. He punished your sins in him. He spared him nothing at all. He kept nothing back. The last ounce was put and the wrath was entirely poured out upon it. He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. And mankind curls up its lip at it. The cross. The blood. It ridicules it. It doesn't appreciate it. It doesn't realize what God has done. It throws it back into his face. Oh, I needn't keep you. There's no need to argue this. When a man has this new heart and this new understanding and looks back upon the things that he said in his ignorance he loathes himself shall I close by telling you an incident I don't think I've told you this before I once saw men aged 77 converted there's nothing remarkable in that don't believe people who tell you that only young people can be converted it's a lie it's not true God can convert a man aged 77 as easily as he can convert a person aged 17 and this man came to this new life and had a new heart at the age of 77. And eventually the time came after he'd joined the church for him to receive his first communion. And he received it. The next morning he was down at my house before I'd got up, broken hearted weeping and crying so terribly that he could scarcely be controlled. I couldn't understand it. Here he is like this on a Monday morning, immediately after last night, which he thought was the greatest night of his life, when he'd taken the bread and the wine to declare his Lord's death till he came. And here he is broken and helpless and utterly disconsolate. What is it? Well, eventually when I'd controlled him, this is what he told me. He said, I shouldn't have taken that communion last night. I said, why not? And then again he couldn't speak. And again I had to control him. I said, why shouldn't you have taken it? 
And then in his tears and in his brokenness, he said, 30 years ago, I was in a public house and we were arguing about God and about Jesus Christ, he said. And I said that Jesus Christ was a bastard. And it had all come back to him. He'd forgotten about it throughout the years. But now it came back. And he loathed himself. And loathed himself so much that he felt he even, even hadn't a right to take communion. Thank God I was able to explain to him that he, like Paul, had done it in ignorance, in unbelief. That it didn't count. That Christ died even for that sin. That even that had been blotted out. That in a sense no one had a greater right to commune than he. But you know when a man realizes that he spurned the love of God. Oh, there's no need to argue. He must loathe himself with an intense and a bitter loathing. What is it in me that makes me so blind? What is it in me that's so hard? How is it that I couldn't see it? Very well, my friend. The simple question I ask you as I close is this. Do you loathe yourself? Do you know this experience? I don't care how happy you are. I don't care what peace you've got. I don't care whether your body has been healed. I don't care what experience you may tell me of. Unless you know something about this self-loathing. I tell you that it isn't Christ who has given you peace. When he gives you these blessings... He does so in terms of bringing you to a knowledge of God and through that to a knowledge of yourself. And when you know yourself, you loathe yourself with bitter loathing and hatred. You will abominate yourself. You'll be disgusted with yourself. Are you? Well, if you're not, I say, go to God. Flee to him and ask him by his Holy Spirit so to reveal his holiness to you that you may see yourself. Ask him by the Spirit so to reveal to you the death of Christ upon the cross as a revelation of sin in its utter loathing and foulness and power and might that you will loathe it within yourself. Ask him by the Spirit so to reveal his love to you that you loathe yourself for your hard and callous and unmoved heart and spirit. Oh, give yourself no rest nor peace until by the Spirit of God you've seen yourself as you are in sin and have seen that nothing but the death of Christ for you upon the cross and his rising again for your justification could ever put you right with God and save your immortal soul and give you blessings not only in this world and in this life, but beyond death in the presence of God through all eternity. Do it now. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.